Hey, it's Jeremy from Jeremy.net. I'm a comic book artist, writer, creator, self-publisher, and I share my creative process here with you online. If you enjoy this channel, like additional bonus live streams twice a month, you can become a Patreon subscriber for as little as $2 a month. Head on over to patreon.com slash Jeremy. It's patreon.com slash G-E-R-I-M-I. In addition to the bonus live streams, you get access to a Patreon-exclusive Discord server where we share art talk, feedback, works in progress, and more, and a digital archive where you can read my comic books online. If you'd like to get a free digital sketchbox, sketchbook, work in progress, and made gifts delivered right to your inbox, blog posts about what I'm reading, what I'm watching, what's inspiring me creatively, you can sign up for my free monthly newsletter at newsletter.jeremy.net. And if you would like to purchase physical copies of my comic books, or if you read digitally, on Kindle, you can go to amazon.jeremy.net. I'll forward you to my Amazon author page. You head over there and pick up my books. And um, just to give you guys a heads up, next week we will not be having a live stream. Why? Because I will be exhibiting at WonderCon Anaheim. So if, I will be at Artist Alley, table D23. So by all means, come out if you're in the uh, LA area and you can check out the show. I'll be there all three days. Come by, say hi. I'll have some books. I will have some prints and a limited selection of original artwork. So hopefully I will see you guys there. All right. So today we're going to do something that we joked about last week. And being the weird person I am, I take jokes sometimes a little too far. So what we're going to do here is we're going to do some more frame studies. However, before we dive into the frame study, let me get a sip of coffee. All right. I'm get my gloves. And I am going to turn this layer with the Sunset Boulevard one off. And I'm going to import a shot from, um, what, no, that's export. Brain a little off today. From Matt Reeves, the Batman. And what we're gonna do that's a little bit different is we joked about those contour, line contour drawings last week where you're just uh, moving the pencil and not looking at the screen. The reason why I am bringing this image in is so that I can make sure I have the proportions correct before I start. So I'm just gonna select that, make sure I'm on the new layer. Fill with gray. <clears throat> and you know what? Let me move these two down just a little bit more centered. Because what I'm going to be doing... Now, I have told you, I don't like doing <laughs> blind contour drawings. I don't, this, this is not fun for me, but normally when I'm doing these, I like to have the thing that I'm drawing from up on the screen. Instead, what I'm going to do, I like to have it on the screen for you guys to see while I'm drawing from it. But instead, what I'm going to be doing is I am opening up that Batman image. And, uh, oh, hey, I see James in the chat. Thanks for, uh, for, for showing up. Good to see you. So... I am pulling up, where is it, this Batman image, and the reason why you guys don't get to see it is because I'm not going to get to see it. I am going to be doing a blind contour drawing during the stream, so I have this image up, and I'm going to be looking at the Batman image that's on my monitor while I'm drawing it here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 
Because here's the thing. If I have it so that you guys can see it while I'm streaming the reference image, then it'll have to be on my monitor, which means I'm going to be looking at it while I'm drawing, which is not the same as the blind contour drawing. The whole point is I'm supposed to absolutely not look at my hand at all and just draw and work, you know, work from it. We'll see how this goes. We're not going to spend the whole stream on this. This was just something that I thought would be a fun, funny thing to do as a change of pace. And we were joking about it last week. And I'm just like, all right, screw it. Let's do it. Um, but that also means that this is going to be just a linear drawing. It's not going to be me going in and adding value the way that I would normally do with a frame study. You know, for me, a, a big part of doing a frame study is working out value, shift, separating foreground from background, using line to, to separate objects, studying the composition. This is literally just going to be me doing a blind contour drawing. So, all right. Um, first thing, believe it or not, I actually need to adjust my body a little bit so that I have as much range of motion to use my shoulder as possible. Because when I'm doing a blind contour drawing, I'm really just, I'm watching and I'm trying not to draw from my wrist because your wrist doesn't have as much of a sense of proportion as your entire body. So I'm trying to draw from the shoulder and the elbow. And I know this is kind of a weird, wonky thing, but let me move this over just enough so that I can see myself in the little box on the side. If you can see when you're drawing from the wrist, your range of motion is just, you know, left, right, up, down, circle around, maybe make some arcs. When you're using your whole shoulder and your elbow, you're kind of like, you're making these large arcs. You're thinking more in the whole. It's like you, your body has a better sense of the drawing space. And when you're trying to emulate what you're looking at, drawing like this and kind of keeping your wrist not perfectly locked, but kind of locked and really trying to get the rest of your body to do the work, it gives you, it, to me, it feels like it gives you more control. If you've never done it before, it's going to feel like you have absolutely no control. But that is one of the, the challenges of learning any new skill. But I have found that over time, over years, trying to learning to draw from your shoulder, which I'm sure a lot of people have, have heard you, you've heard people say that, but maybe people have said it and you never really understood what the hell they meant. And so me, that little physical demo was me just trying to show you that's what it means to me and that's how I use it. It does feel like it gives me more control. Let's see here. So James says, okay, what I would do for environments was I would take an image and use that for outlining. Then I would add details. I never thought of doing it this way. Um, well, well, for me, it's honestly not necessarily about environments per se. Well, I mean, each e here's the, the interesting thing. When it comes to doing film or frame studies, each one can have a different purpose. Because if you're doing a close-up, then you're really, it's like doing a portrait study. If you're doing a, an environment, then it's environment study. Um, all of them are composition studies because the cinematographer is framing every single shot and they have a, a narrative intent with that. So all of them are composition studies. And for me, the only reason for having this square and making sure it's the exact same is because it makes just makes it easier for the measuring, which is going to be hard enough as it is. And I actually have decided I'm going to switch. Nope. Let's make this white instead. Alpha lock. <clears throat> I also realize since it's a blind contour drawing, there's not much point in me working in grays and values. I might as well. I might as well just um wait, hide, damn it. I might as well just make it a black and white line drawing. Let's see here. And James says, yeah, portrait. I was thinking about how I wouldn't rely on being able. <laughs> rely on being able to see the image so much. Um, well, see, that's the interesting thing. When I'm generally generally drawing portraits, like, for instance, when I'm taking a figure drawing class on drawing the head, or if I'm actually 
sitting in front of a person, what I literally will try to do is I will take whatever my drawing tablet is and I will try, like, let's say that this book is my drawing board. What I will try to do is if I'm drawing you right there, I will try to line up my drawing board so it's just off to the side. So I'm literally like looking at you, looking at the board, looking at you, looking at the board, looking at you, looking at the board. And I'm almost, I'm not trying to transcribe and copy visually, but I'm trying to keep my reference in the line of sight so that I can look at where my drawing is and say, all right, am I capturing the personality? Are there th places where the proportions are off? Um, is the anatomy wonky? Are there features wrong? Did I make the nose too long, the eyes too far to, far apart? And ha for me, that's that's one of the reasons why whenever I'm using reference, you guys will usually see it lined up in the document. Is because I like to have that reference right there. So I'm just looking and it's hard to find the right words because I'm not trying to copy the reference one for one, but I'm always trying to look at the reference and make sure that what I am using, the what, the way in which I'm trying to make the reference inform my drawing or my artwork, I'm looking to see if I'm capturing that, if I'm taking the right things away, if that makes any sense. It's not about copying one for one, but it's like if I'm trying, if it's a tonal thing that I'm trying to get, there's a certain anatomical detail, if there's a linear quality or structural quality, whatever that is, I'm looking at the reference saying, Am I getting that in my work? Am I just so it's not just a, a Xerox copy, but I'm looking for something and I'm always trying to see if it's there. Um, let's see here. Chris is in the chat. Hey Chris, thanks for dropping by. Good to see you. James says, I like the flow and feel of blind contour drawings. Sometimes I would have a hard time focusing having um having look at something when when drawing it having to go back and forth. Um, yeah, well, see, that's interesting. I, For me, the blindness is what is what is so hard for me. The going back and forth, it just feels like... To me, it's like you take a fork of a, a dish, you scoop it up, you put the fork in your mouth. For me, that's like looking back and forth. And I feel like blind drawing is like you just got a table... And you, it's kind of the same thing. If you're trying to eat a dish without looking down at the plate, that's kind of how I feel like the, the back and forth is is for me um, versus versus drawing blind. Weird analogy. I don't think it works well. Um, let's see here. And Martin's in the chat. Hey, hey, hey. Good to see you. All right. So because this is such a bizarre exercise for me, if I don't reply to any of the chat comments for a few minutes, Pardon me for that because this is super weird and something I, I don't do very often. So I will come back to the, the the chat comments. I don't know after this disaster piece is done. We'll see. And I see Paul's in the chat. Hey, Paul, good to see you. Thanks for for popping in. So just to catch you up real quick, you guys can't see the reference I'm looking at because I'm doing a blind contour drawing. So I have to not have the reference on my my screen that you guys can see. I have it up here on a, a monitor in front of me. And I am drawing, I'm doing a blind contour. First off, let me just make sure. All right. Turn that all the way up opacity wise. Bring the brush size down. Oh, that's a little too small. Well, I don't know. If I leave the brush size up like that, it's almost like I'm doing the. I'm just testing out whether I want to have a thick line or a thin line. Let's go thin. Let's go a little thicker line. Um, so, all right, this is so hard to not look at this. Look at the tablet while I'm doing it, and I'm drawing a still frame. Oh crap! Now I realize what I have to do. I have to go into my settings and turn off the um, the thing where you stop. Procreate, if you hold down a line, it'll straighten it. And I need to turn that off while I'm doing this because I'm going to be doing a lot of stopping and adjusting. Let me see here. Pressure and smoothing. I think it's under. 
stabilization, motion filtering. I don't remember where the command is. Disable and redo. Let's see here. Yeah, I know this is super exciting for you guys. I just realized that thing that Procreate does where you hold it down, I have to figure out like how to turn that off because I'm gonna be holding it down for the entire drawing. Um, let's see here. Right interface, right-handed interface. Yeah, if anyone remembers off the top of their heads how to turn off the um, that setting where it automatically will smooth out a line. Let me see here. Christ, where is that stupid control? Line editing. Yeah, this is super exciting. No. All right. Um, I did not think about this before starting the stream. I feel like it's got to be under pressure and smoothing. Oh, Paul says, isn't it on the actual brush? And I think you're right. I'm going to go into the brush settings real quick and look for it. Thank you, Paul. Um, let's see here. James says, but, um, like you were doing before, you had a few reference images on a page. I feel like too much reference can overwhelm me. And you're really just taking ideas when you're doing something fantasy-based. Um, well, you know, I think... I can see how having too many references can be overwhelming, but, and I, and I do usually, I try to find, I may have five or six reference images on the screen at one time, but really it's more like I'm looking at just, there's two of them that I'm really looking at. It's here. There's the regular st stabilization. Streamline, stabilization, motion filtering. Apple Pencil. Cursor outline. For Christ's sakes. Yeah, the command that I'm looking for is just one where it's like a how long it's supposed to wait for it to auto correct a line, straighten it. And you can just turn it off completely versus uh, a certain amount of time. Just the motion filtering. Expression. Oh, you know what? I think it might not be. I think it might be under drawing assistant, like where you turn on the turn on and off the perspective. I think that is where the uh, the setting is. Let's 
So let's see here. Oh, see Philip in the chat. How you doing, Philip? Byron there. Hey, hey, good people. Hey, hey, Byron. Good to see you. <laughs> Trying to find stupid commands so that I can do a stupid <laughs> gesture drawing. So it's under Canvas Settings, and it's under Page Assist. And drawing, I believe it's under here. I think it's under here. But I have all of these turned off, so that doesn't make any sense. This is where I thought it was. All right. <laughs> Byron says, I swear my spelling gets worse each time. You know what? I auto-corrected. I auto-corrected the auto-correct, so I didn't even notice there was a typo. Um, James says, ah, lots of bells and whistles. Uh, yeah, I don't see it under here, so I think maybe, let me go back to what Paul was saying before. I think he, maybe he's right, that it's under somewhere under the brush controls. But it's been so long since I've messed with those settings that I do not remember. Where they are. Which is going to create quite a bit of an extra challenge just doing a blind contour drawing because it's not going to be a full contour drawing. I'm going to have to keep pulling my the tip of the pencil up just to make sure it doesn't keep straightening out the line. All right, if I can't find it here, then I'm just gonna move forward with this exercise. Cursor outline, hover fill. Yeah, I can't. I can't find it. Never mind. We're just going to go forward. Well, actually, hang on a sec. One more thing. Edit drawing guide. All right. So the assisted drawing is turned off. <clears throat> All right, it absolutely is not that. Yeah, all right, okay, all right. Forget it, I tried. And let's uh, let's erase this. Whoop! That is not what I want to do. What I want is to paint out that. <clears throat> so now things are going to be super tricky because I'm going to be doing a blind contour drawing, but I can't hold the. Uh, <laughs> let's see here paul says if you think i'm right you are sorely misguided <laughs> paul says i'm gonna google it see if i can find it be right back thank you paul Ugh. this is on me i should have looked this up before starting the stream and i didn't think of it um <clears throat> so, let's see here. So James says, you were trying to make it so you don't get straight lines. Yes, exactly. Because when doing a blind contour drawing, for me, it involves a lot of making very slow lines and figuring stuff out. And with Procreate, if you draw a line and you stop and you hold, it will straighten it. Now, this is a, a benefit if you're trying to quickly do perspective you can block in stuff and, and block in straight lines. 
And normally I have it set so that, like you saw, I didn't do it instantly. It's sort of those things where I have to consciously stop and hold and then wait for it to straighten. Um, but I would be doing that a lot doing a contour drawing. <clears throat> so I kind of wanted to turn off the, the stop and hold. But I haven't changed those settings in such a long time. I forgot where the settings are. <clears throat> anyway. If Paul, find, Paul, if you find the answer, I hopefully will, will come back and look before I'm done with this because I'm going back in and trying this again. And I'm just going to just lift the pencil up a little bit when I get to the end of a line and hopefully it won't straighten too many of these. Yeah, this is a great experiment, huh? All right. So uh, lift up. All right, I cheated already because I looked down and I didn't mean to. I just had to know <laughs> how, how bad this was. All right. I can tell that the proportion is way off just by how, um, where my hand is on the screen. Um, okay, and I lift it up again. Oh, wait. Well... I turned off the uh, accidentally turned off the um, the alpha lock All right now from here I need to you know I should not have just gone and done the whole silhouette for the figure because now I got to work my way back up All right, I saw that it just straightened something. Had to undo. Glad he doesn't have any eyeballs in this drawing. I can just feel how wretched this is. <laughs> I see Omar in the chat. Um, I can't lift my pencil right now to uh, to come and respond, but I see you, man. I'm doing a blind contour drawing. Oh, God. There's a reason why I hate these. <laughs> I think by nature, we hate whatever makes our drawings look awful. Oof. Oof. <laughs> oh, all right. Paul, I, I think that this is about as far as I can take this blind contour drawing. So, so don't, I apologize for making you waste your time trying to find the answer for that. Um, after the stream, I will look it up, look up the answer just so that I know for future reference, because I should know how to turn that on and off. <laughs> Byron says, I can't tell if it's Batman or Bugman. <laughs> you know what? I this is the thing I love about you guys. I feel comfortable enough doing something so horrible and embarrassing in front of you guys. <laughs> oh wow. Um <laughs> All right, j just for for okay, so Paul found it um under preferences um gesture control assisted drawing
let's see here apple pencil apple drawing with apple pencil will always be assisted now i have that turned off <clears throat> Finger will always be assisted. Tapping will toggle assisting on this layer. Drawing with Apple Pencil. Apple Pencil drawing while holding the, whatever that is, I guess it's the control button. So I see that there. Paul says Batman Picasso. I'll go, I'll go back to the screen in a second so you guys can see it. I just want to check here. Um, oh, Quick Shape. That is what it is. I kept trying to remember what the name of it is. So it's called Quick Shape. And you guys, well, actually, can I zoom in? All right. I can't zoom in on this menu. But under here, under Quick Shape, it says Draw and Hold. And that's where it will correct the line. And it has both a delay that you can set custom, and I'm not going to touch that because I have it right where I wanted, but you can turn it on and off. And that's what I was looking for. So I have to remember that's under quick shape. So hang on, let me turn it on for a second, just so you guys can see the difference. When I uh, have quick shape turned on, if I make a circle, that's not a perfect circle, but it'll correct it. And if I tap the screen, it'll help put it in proportion so I can adjust it. Same thing if I draw a square, that's a wonky square, but then it'll sort of adjust it. And then even then I can tap the line and, and move these points. So that's the, um, the adjustment thing. Now I'm going to turn that off. Well, first off, I'm going to show you my first attempt with the, uh, <laughs> with the quick shape on. Um, let me see here. Let me just undo those two lines. Um, just your controls. All right. So let's take both of these. Which we'll do. Duplicate. Duplicate. All I'm doing is moving this around so you guys can see the difference. So there's the movie frame up top. Here's my nightmarish drawing below. I have to scale both of them down so they'll fit in the screen at the same time. <laughs> I can't tell if it's Batman or Bugman. <laughs> so yeah, that was my uh, my blind contour drawing attempt, <clears throat> and I'm gonna try doing it one more time now with the <laughs> with the uh, the drawing assistants turned off. And King's Little Fitness comes in with the quickness, just like gesture control, quick shape, turn it off. <laughs> Where were you 20 minutes ago, bro? <laughs> I say that jokingly. I should have I should have known that. I just haven't messed with the settings in such a long time. <laughs> and yes, Paul, Paul says, uh, uh, King's, King's Little Fitness got it. Uh, I had to keep reading. <clears throat> James says it's a flattering portrayal of the Cape Crusader. Let's see here. And there are some, some spam in the chat. Um, Kingsley Fitness says, imagine, imagine looking at someone and drawing them indirectly. Well, you know, I mean, that's where this whole conversation came from. Last week, as we were correcting portraits, we were talking about blind contour drawings and how some people find them very enjoyable and relaxing and useful. And how I, I hated them in school. <clears throat> and I knew I was going to do a film still this week 
I joked about doing a film still and doing a blind contour drawing. And then I just decided, you know what? Screw it. Let's do Batman. Hang on. I got to blow my nose for a second. Okay, audio back. <clears throat> so I'm going to do this one more time now with the, um, the control off. With the quick shape correct off. So let's go back here. Let me turn off the alpha lock. Clear that layer, select this layer, let's fill it with white, let's alpha lock, let's go back to black, and let's take one more <laughs> stab at that, because that obviously did not take very long. Um, I mean, literally, I spent most of the stream trying to figure out the setup for it for a drawing that took less than five minutes. Let's see here. Paul says, funny, I'm going to work on a drawing later where I need to turn this off. Fortuitous. Well, hey, man, it's good timing. Right? I'm glad you got something out of this. Because honestly, this is one of those like, um, like one of those episodes of South Park where they go through, they do all that ridiculous stuff. They're like, I feel like we're supposed to learn a lesson from this, but I don't know what I, I didn't learn anything. Um, all right. Just all right. holding, it's not correcting. Perfect. <clears throat> so let's see here. You know, and I will tell you the mistake. I say the mistake as if there weren't countless, but I think the mistake that I made was not working from one end of the figure to the other. I started by just trying to work out the entire silhouette of the figure because that is how I draw, is I try to work out the major pieces first. And I think what would work better is what I'm doing now. I'm attempting to work from one side of the figure to the other And who knows if this will give me something even remotely like better results. You know what? The other thing that's interesting is I've spent so much time in figure drawing class where the point was do not copy your reference. Do not look at them and just trace what you see. You know, inject some character, inject some of yourself into it. You know, put some personality there. You know, try to capture something unique. Mixing what you observe with what you know about human anatomy into a drawing. And literally with the blind contour drawing, I just realized as I'm looking at it, the problem is I need to get mentally in sync with the reference I'm looking at. And I really do visually have to run my finger, my mental finger, along the surface of this image. My mental finger. It sounds kind of gross. Um, but it's like this whole process is the antithesis of what I try to do or what I've been training to do in figure drawing classes for the last several years. All right. And I guess in here, I'm just scribbling little openings in her hair, like little places where you can see the strands. All right. Whew. Wow. I don't think that's any better. Ooh. 
Wow. <laughs> Let's see here. <laughs> Paul says, hey, if you knew Copperfield was going to mess up his trick ahead of time, that show would be sold out. <laughs> Not a bad. I'll take that as a, I'll take that comparison. James says, "Yeah, it's just reference. In most cases, um, you're going to use reference for something that doesn't exist." Yeah. Well, you know what's funny is when I look at reference, I think of it if it's not a portrait or a landscape or something. Then the, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to look at these. I, the reason why I, I know you said that having too much reference can be distracting. But usually what I'm doing is if I'm trying to draw, let's say, a dragon breathing fire, I'll have like a photo of a burning building with a lizard along with a snake that has a scale texture that I like along with like a human being in a posture I want the dragon in. And it's like my mind is taking all of these different aspects that are unrelated and combining them. So that's the reason why I might have more reference on the screen than you would probably use if I'm drawing something from imagination that I'm pulling a whole bunch of things together, which is different from, let's say, the James Gurney approach, which after he has his sketches, he'll go and he'll build an actual clay sculpture of this thing that doesn't exist and light that and take photo reference from it and have it there while he's paint the physical object and the reference there while he's painting. Um, which I think is a super dope process. I've only tried it a couple of times. And I think that it is great for individual illustration and picture made picture making. But I don't think it's great for um, for comic books only because you're, you, in theory, you should be working much quicker, getting your pages done quicker. <laughs> See here. Byron says, this one feels more metal. I can't tell you why. <laughs> Paul says, we're here for you, Jeremy. <laughs> Byron says, I respect James, but he's insane. Let's be real. You know, James, you bring a lot of good points. They're, they're challenging because it's more, I think it's more about the fact that a lot of the conversations we have about here is when we, we share a process with each other, there's things in which we're like, oh my God, it's not just me. We're all, it's universal. And there's things that we share about it that I'm like, that we will turn to look at another artist and be like, are you even human like that? You know, there's going to be things where we feel all connected. And there's things that are going to be alien to, to us. But I think the best stuff is when we, something is shared with us that is absolutely antithetical to what we would do, but we give it a try anyway. And that's kind of the spirit I was going into doing a contour drawing with is I'm like, yeah, I already know I don't like doing these, but let's have some fun. Let's play with it. Let me do something I wouldn't normally do. I mean, if anything, I feel like that's kind of the point of us hanging out and, and you guys hanging out here and us talking while we're doing stuff online, you know, is sharing not necessarily the stuff that everybody shares, but the weird stuff, the experimental stuff, the uh, the stuff that sometimes goes sideways or maybe just opens my mind to trying something new. Because just the idea of doing a – take these – don't do that. Just the idea. Of doing a, a process. That I ordinarily would not. And know that it may well come out. Not particularly great. And sharing it. There's something magically delicious about it. All right, let me just, there we go. So now you guys can see Metal Batman. <laughs> um, and I'll tell you what, what you've really got me thinking about, James, is the idea that while this might have been horrible, what would happen if I were to sit down and do 50 blind contour drawings, 100 blind contour drawings, what if I got to the point where I can look at something and I can very accurately, clearly measure its silhouette just by building that muscle? Because as you can see from this drawing, 
I don't have that muscle. I don't have the ability to just look at a thing and get the silhouette down. Now, that doesn't mean that my goal is to be able to visually copy anything I see, like a, you know, like a, capturing it like a camera and getting it down on canvas. But given that my, I've often, I've already told you guys a million times that proportions are my weakness. Maybe working in contour drawings as an exercise will help me develop the skill to quickly correct my proportion. So it's not really about copying things. It's about just simply looking at something and saying, oh, this is off, let me move it here, move it there. Um, and I don't know for sure if blind contour drawings would help with that, but the hardest part for me is that, you know, in theory, I'm, I'm working on my next comic. I also continue to take figure drawing classes. I'm always working on anatomy. Uh, I'm working on volume, proportion, composition, all these other things. And the idea of saying, all right, on top of that, I'm going to add doing five blind contour drawings a day. <clears throat> Maybe it's like there's so many things that I can and should be studying. I'm all, do I ha even have the time to add this to my schedule? But I actually do believe that I don't know what I can take away from this. But I don't think that it's a pointless exercise. Just in this, I'm like, huh. I feel like I pulled on a thread that I'm like, maybe there is something over time that I will learn from this that will help make my different approach than this to illustrating. It, that can help imp improve that. And I'm not sure what's in there, but I feel like there's something there. There's a little tickle in the back of my brain saying, huh, follow this thread. But it's finding the time to keep following that thread, to chase these things. Um, for instance, this might even have a little bit of the shape and the composition of it, but it doesn't really have the sense of him leaning forward into the frame the way that he is, really leaning down towards that woman. Um, let's see here. James says, your drawing has some flow to it. It's unusual, perhaps surreal, in that Batman's head isn't completely attached to his neck. Um well, I'll, I know that, you know, one of the big problems with the early Batman costumes, like Christian Bale and even, you know, Michael Keaton would say, you couldn't turn your head in those costumes. It was one big rubber suit. If you needed to turn, you would just turn your whole body. So, you know, maybe having a neck that's disconnected might be helpful. <laughs> but yeah, it is definitely not on there. Um, let's see here. Oh, Byron, when he was talking about James being insane, he was talking about James Gurney <laughs> and the, the maquettes. And he said, I was talking about James Gurney. So so pardons to, to our James. You're ours now, by the way. <laughs> but, uh, but Byron says, I was talking about James Gurney making a sculpture in order to render light and shadow, by the way, just in case that wasn't clear. You, you, I totally missed that. So I'm glad you clarified. Um, and to give everyone else context, if you have not seen the book, James Gurney's book, imaginative realism um the whole book is about how does he do realistic illustrations of things that don't exist and a lot of it is dinosaurs and you know he's famous for dinotopia among other things and doing very realistic illustrations of creatures that are extinct that we literally do not see and he talks about his whole process in the book of how he Basically, it's interesting this conversation we have about reference because a lot of it is the different types of reference that he builds, whether it's an archive of photo reference to look at, um, researching from real life animals and analogs and being able to take a human, pose them like a creature, being able to take a, a, a creature from the zoo and give it human or anthropomorphic qualities. Um, but one of the things that he talks about is building maquettes. Sometimes it's a single figure. Sometimes he'll build a small like foam core or cardboard, like a whole city. And he'll build it. He'll paint it in the basic colors he sees the thing as. And then he'll get lights and put colored filters on so that if it's going to be sunset, he'll add sunset lighting. If it's going to be dawn or it's going to be midday, whatever it is. He will build the physical thing that he needs to paint. And then he will photograph that and have it there and have the, the physical thing there while he's doing the painting. I, I know I'm just repeating what I said earlier, but that's an insane amount of work 
for a single illustration. But I mean, it's an impossible workflow for working in comics. In comics, I think the best you can do is either have a library of 3D models that either someone else built for you that you purchased, or if you just that good at like Blender or whatever that you can build a very simple, quick 3D object of the thing you need, put it in the position you need, drop it into your comic panel, and then draw over it. That's the closest equivalent I think that would be even possibly usable for for working in comics um but yeah the, the i can see that process when you're doing a painting that you may be going to spend a month on if you're going to spend a month on it then yeah a whole week out of the the four weeks that you're working might just be gathering and building reference material you know well let's say let's say you spend a week doing thumbnails and getting the concept approved then you spend another week building like if it's a city that has a dinosaur flowing over it building the model that you're going to use and photographing it and then you spend two weeks on the actual painting a lot of work yes um but i think the whole point of the book is that people will look at these fancy off the reference thing comes up a lot and people are like how people often think well how are you, you have to be able to pull stuff out of your imagination because you look at somebody who can build something that paints something that does not exist and it looks realistic you're like well they can do it and they obviously didn't have reference because whatever they're painting doesn't exist so i have to be able to paint it out of my head and what james gurney is breaking down is no people even if they're doing do, doing things that do not exist and people who are artists who have incredible imaginations they are still building reference and so if you're painting something that doesn't exist, the challenge is how do you make that reference? But you know, his whole point is everybody uses reference. Let's see here. All right. Rant over. What what else we got here? Um King's Low Fitness says, my thoughts, eyes closed, seeing what's in mind's eye, and drawing that at the same time. Is there a name for that? Um I'm sure that there is. I can't think of it right now. Um, but yeah, I, I'm sure there is a name for it. Um, I mean, that they are, there's also something which is not drawing what's in your mind's eye, but there is what's called automatic drawing, which is when you don't look at the paper, but you're not looking at reference. You're just letting your hand move and see what comes out. So it's kind of like the drawing equivalent of using a Ouija board. Um, that's called automatic drawing, but I'm sure there's a name for not for looking inward and trying to draw that picture that you see while your eyes are closed. Um, I mean, to be honest, I feel like when you're drawing in general, you're drawing what you see in your mind's eye and you're trying to get it down on the page, whether your eyes are closed or open. Um, let's see here. Hmm. James says, uh, yeah, common first names can cause confusion. Um, I'm not that familiar with Gurney, but I'll look into his stuff. Well, I, I'll tell you, James Gurney has a very robust YouTube channel. So just when you're done, <laughs> when, when you're done, uh, when we're done with this stream, pop over to, to YouTube and look him up over there. I don't know if he has a Facebook page. He might. But if it is, it should just be reposts of all of his videos. Um, he shares a lot of the content that's in his book on on his channel, and you can see <clears throat> it's either going to be him painting landscapes in different lighting conditions, or it's going to be him painting imaginative, you know, fantasy work and showing the process of how he does that. But I highly recommend the book Imaginative Realism. But you can get a lot of examples of what's in that book on his YouTube channel. So definitely check that out. Uh, James also says 3D models can help with storyboarding. I never really liked storyboarding. Um, I like storyboarding, but I had trouble with the um, the space story that I was doing before. And I don't know why. Um, maybe I was just putting too much pressure on myself, or maybe I was just out of practice of doing storyboarding. Um, I do need to get back into it some more. But, you know, things continue to evolve. Amar says, hello. And... Uh, Hello all. Hello, Jeremy. I'm outside watching on my phone. 
Byron says, I hope, hey, Amar, I hope it's not cold um, where you are, <laughs> where you are, um, where it is, as it is, ah, I'm not, hope it's not as cold where you are as it is over here. I'm sorry. I'm, my ability to put together words is, is, is disintegrating. Um, James says, I think that when you try to conjure up something out of your head, you often don't get the result you're expecting, which that to me is kind of one of the, the magical things about drawing. I completely agree. Um, I think that there are artists who can make a clear picture in their mind and then get it down on the page. But I think for me, the <clears throat> what is interesting is that what seems like a clear picture in my mind, when I start getting it down on the page, the reason why I tend not to get what I expected is because I thought that it was a clear picture when I just closed my eyes. And when I start putting on the page, I realize that it is not a clear picture. It is a greasy smear on a on a piece of glass. You know, it's not at all as clearly fixed as I thought it was. And the process of me drawing it is the process of me clarifying something that I thought was clear. And it involves making decisions about the um the uh the object to define things that are not defined Let's see here and amar says uh it was yesterday it being cold meaning cold it was cold yesterday fine today and he says uh wouldn't it be imaginative drawing um that's not the name of james gurney's channel he says um he does have an active youtube channel the book is imaginative drawing, but the channel I think is just James Gurney. Yeah, I think that's all. Oh, it's either James Gurney or Gurney Journeys. I can't remember which. Um, I mean, I've been subscribed to it for years, but um, let's see here. <laughs> and Soretzi in the chat says everyone uses ref reference. Hey, Jeremy. Hey, good to see you, man. Thanks for for dropping in. And Byron says, "Type one, my part as cold as it is over here." Um, I'm sorry you are freezing over there. It's actually kind of nice out. It's cool out here. High 60s. You no, know, sunny. It was a little cold. It was windy yesterday, but uh, but I'm in the LA area. So and Amar says, I've been drawing things from out of my head since I was a kid, so it's a normal thing for me. Yeah, you know, I honestly, as a kid. I, the reason why I resisted figure drawing for so many years in my life is because when I drew things out of my imagination, the proportions might be wonky, might be a little weird, but it felt I could get what I could by drawing and erasing get what was in my head on the page. So it did look like it was in my imagination. Whereas when I draw, tried to draw what was in front of me, models, people, cars, environments, I couldn't do it. Literally, like the thing we're doing with the blind contour drawing here, just my ability to look at something, pardon me, the ability to look at something and copy it, I just, I lacked that skill. Um, and to some degree, I still do lack that skill. But I've found over the years, as I pressed against that, I've strengthened that ability to and it, it is isn't me copying per se, but I've strengthened that ability to take what's in front of me, internalize it, and reshape it. Because when I try to copy directly what I see, um, I can do it, but I'm rarely happy with the results. Just rename this. <clears throat> so yeah, I, I'm kind of the, the same thing in terms of like drawing out of my head makes more sense for me than drawing in reality, but I have kind of forced myself to do it and I've gotten better at it. Now I actually enjoy it. Damn. Byron says it's 35 right now, but the wind is making things crispy. Whew. All right. So we're at about an hour here, but considering that we spent all that time <laughs> dicking around with the settings and then, um, 
me not even you know doing two blind contour drawings, both of which wretched. First off, let me draw, turn my uh, quick shape settings back on. And I am going to, no, we'll stay in here. Let me add, insert the photo. So there was a Hitchcock movie, and I think it's called The Lodger. And I saw this image. And I found it very striking. And I thought, I want to do a frame study of this. And I seem to decide, do I want to do this one above, one below? Or side by side? And I feel like no matter how I do it, frame-wise, it's going to be like just sort of... It's going to be tight either way. So let's create a new layer. Let's add some gray. Move this layer over to the side. Let's alpha channel that or alpha lock. Make this a little bit bigger. <clears throat> All right. So I just found this image very dramatic and compelling and creepy. So let's see here. <laughs> Kingslow Fitness says, I remember drawing Bart Simpson a lot back when, said others started uh, making other types of Bart, even Rasta Bart. I feel like I've remembered seeing people doing cartoons of Bart Simpson as just different types of characters. He says, I think it was, um, um, it was due to seeing that character daily. All right. So when I'm starting this, I'm starting by thinking, all right, well, where's the ceiling? Because when I squint, he's just completely in darkness. Um, like, I don't know if I'll end up making everything surrounding him black. But notice that the shape of the roof already acts as a um, compositional arrow pointing to the character. He is centered right down there, the bottom of the frame. And I think what I liked about this when I saw it was how much it reminds me of the shadow. Because it's almost like a Nosferatu kind of creepiness in terms of the, him being kind of pale and sort of lanky. Here. 
Soretsi says, um, I don't picture things in my head first as far as rendering. I picture the positions of the figure and the objects which in, then inspire the rendering. My process is being able to light the figure or object correctly. This ability comes from years of doing still life drawings and figure drawings and being a perfectionist. I would render these hyper realistically. So now I'm good at lighting, which translates to good coloring. Yep, great point. Great point. Color is value. Um, in fact, it isn't like I don't know who originally said it, but that expression that gets said all the time is that value does all the work, color takes all the credit. Um, this is there are different things I want to realistically render as practice, like uh, defined abdomens. Um, I feel like it would help me some some more in comic art. <clears throat> well, you know, it's funny for me. I I have a love hate relationship with realism, in that I am not a photorealistic artist, and I know that. But what I'm looking to get down on the page is a sense of lighting that is not photorealistic, but lighting that does not break, it, that creates sort of a its own rules uh, or its own reality, its own sense of realism, its own logic, and then does not break that logic. So it feels consistent, even if it's fantastical, like, like Adventure Time. No one would say that Adventure Time is a realistic style. It's cartoony and loopy and, uh, and surrealistic, but it's consistent in its own logic. It doesn't break its own logic. And I think that that's what I strive for as opposed to realism. And I say that not like that is what artists should strive for. Um, if I had the capacity, people tend to, tend to be impressed by realism, whether you're, um, you know, people tend, tend to be impressed by the ability of a human being to depict reality in a drawing. So if you have the capacity to do realism, I say go for it. I mean, there's a reason why Alex Ross is one of the most sought after cover artists um of all time so i think if you have that capacity like in your case soretzi the hell that i'm like by all means lean into that i don't think i have that capacity i don't think it's one of my strengths and that's where i i had to figure out well what works for me and what seems to work for me is a combination of cartooning and illustration which i look at I look at illustration as different from realism um, and, but also different from cartooning in that illustration is trying to apply the fundamentals of light and volume and structure to something that is cartoony and surrealistic. And I will tell you that 
I am tempted to do this again on my own, not because I want to hide it from you, but because I don't think I have time to sit here and completely redo this properly. But I'm looking at how much extra space there is on this side of the canvas. And I feel like the proportions, if the point of this as a start, if the, just the point of me even bothered to do a, a value study or a frame study is working on composition, the composition feels very, very off. by that I just mean how much the figure is filling the frame versus the stairwell filling the frame. I mean, the photo, I feel like it's a beautiful shot. I just feel like I'm not capturing that beauty. see here <laughs> yeah Soretzi says uh, color takes all the credit so, so true um, it's it's an oft said um, expression from a lot of color uh, from a lot of painting teachers that I've heard repeated many times so definitely not taking credit for that one um, Byron says looking for that sense of believability yeah, I think that's what I'm going for. It's trying to create a sense of believability, which is not the same as realism. Um, Soretzi says, don't get me wrong. Realism is not necessary. Form is actually dead on. I agree with that. You definitely need form and structure. Um, well, I need form and structure because to be honest, I, there's other people I look at who it might feel a little flat, a little bit wonk. Well, you know, for instance, Trad Moore. I don't know if you're familiar with his artwork. But his artwork feels kind of liquid and cartoony and kind of adventure time-ish, except it's superheroes. But to some degree, you're right, because his drawing still feels like it has structure. And structure, to me, is form. But he distorts it in such a way that he's definitely pushing in, in more into cartoon than he is... If you look at a spectrum of realism, then in the middle, illustrative with structure, and then cartoony and surrealistic at the, the far end, he's pushing towards the cartoony and sur surrealistic. Um, I think of, of Trad Moore and, uh, and Christian Ward is another artist whose work reminds me of that. Um, and that's not to say that they are similar artists. They're both very distinct and unique, but they have that characteristic liquid fluidity fluidity in their work um, where something doesn't necessarily have to feel structural. And I think to me that also is farther down the spectrum than I am in terms of being illustrative. And I think it's interesting. I think I'm drawn to things that are just outside of my comfort zone. Like I'm not a interested in being a photorealistic artist, but I am interested in art that's just a little bit more realistic than mine is. Like when I look at Adam Hughes, Adam Hughes is not a photorealistic artist, but his understanding of lighting, rendering, and, and anatomy is highly influenced by realism. Um, kind of like more like Norman Rockwell or J.C. Leindecker, where it's not about being photorealistic. But well, I mean, Leindecker can get pretty realistic. But I mean, not line digger. Rockwell can get pretty realistic, but and while you can see that influence in Adam Hughes' work, it's definitely still more cartoony. Let's see here. Byron says, um, "I can understand the feeling. I don't like drawing realism for my actual works, but I'll do it in practice." 
Soretsi says, I do think understanding realis realistic light and shadows shadow play has helped some of my favorite artists, such as Joe Mad and Larry Stroman. Yes, yes, definitely. Um, because they pretty much they use lighting and shadow to just say, this is facing towards the light, this is facing away from light. And that is the most simplistic expression of form that, that one can think of, whether you're drawing something that's a, a weird sculptural, abstract sculpture, or a human arm. It's just, this is facing towards light, this is facing away from the light. You just you describe that accurately, or clearly at least, and you have clearly described form. In fact, I'd say describing it clearly is more important than describing it accurately, because if you describe it clearly, then describing something that is clear but incorrect is distortion. Now, if it's done willy-nilly and without consideration, then that's you know just an inexperienced artist. But when it is done with intent, um, you get something like Sam Keith with the Max. You know, obviously, very very cartoony, but also really understands structure. In fact, you have to understand structure better in order to intentionally express the, these abstract ideas. And Soretzi says, um, yeah, with Joe Mad and, and Larry Stroman, he said their work is as far from realism as you can get, as you can possibly get. I agree. They're, but their distortions are beautiful. It's a great – Larry Stroman himself, I, I love Joe Mad too, but Larry Stroman, it, I mean, it's not Picasso level, but he's, he does these beautiful abstractions of form, you know. Um, in fact, I would say it, it, it's like – it's like if Picasso was elegant. And I know that Picasso was a brilliant realist painter before he started abstract expressionism. I know that. But what Larry Stroman does is like, uh, I mean, I can't, I can't think of, a, when I think of people who are doing what he does, I think of stuff like Mondrian, where he, Mondrian is doing, he's just doing grids and lines and circles and shapes. But what he's doing is he's doing this beautiful, breakdown of form with these juxtapositions of lines and curves and there's more curves than there are straight lines but he's doing it in this way that it feels like a beautiful math it's not like looking at grids and circles and structural things it's this beautiful architecture of form man you got me on a stroman jack i gotta pull out my old issues at x factor and tribe you could do a deep dive get back into it um let's see here King's Little Fitness has gone into the drawing. Finger painting since my Apple Pencil died. Feels great going in with both hands. All right, man, go for it. Yeah, that you know, you can still do all that work whether you got an Apple Pencil or not. Um, he says, I drew the, the steps for it first. It was a bigger shape in the foreground. Soretzi says, with Trad Moore's work, there's a very clear foreground, midground, background. It's very layered, has depth perception. Yes, very much agreed. Um, Let's see. Whoop. Skipped over James. Uh, James says, I feel like Richard Corbin was influenced by realism as well. Yeah, you know what? That's a, a good point. I haven't looked at Corbin's work in a while. Um, I, I, you're wild comparison. But comparing Corbin and Adam Hughes in the sense purely that Adam Hughes is doing illustration, like doing cartoon illustration, but rendering it with a Norman Rockwell type lighting. And in that same way, Corbin feels like he is distorting the figure and forms kind of in the way that he came before Simon Beasley, but he's distorting the figure and he's cartooning like Simon, like in the same manner that Simon Beasley, but he's pulling from that same realistic rendering that uh that Adam Hughes does in terms of pulling from a Rockwell-esque type rendering. So you know I can see a, a comparison, a, a connection in DNA between those two artists. Um let's see here. Soretzi says, uh, oh, he was talking about Trad Moore in terms of foreground, midground, background. He says, which takes his work out of the cartoony realm and into realism. Um, oh. And he says, uh, you know, Stormy is coming out with a new tribe book in June, right? I didn't know when it was coming out, but I saw on his Instagram that he had a new tribe book coming. I just didn't know when. So thank you for giving me that heads up. I will definitely look out for it. 
All right, I'm going to just real quick finish blocking in just the major values on this piece and then calling it a day because we're a bit over time here and uh, there are other things in the day that await me. So let me get in here and just... I mean, just the way that this railing of the stair cuts through the frame. And it's funny that um, that Suretz, you had just mentioned uh, trad more with the foreground, midground, background composition, because I don't do that enough in my own work in terms of really paying attention to the environment and how it, uh, using the environment to frame the story. I don't do it. And this piece and the, the conversation about Trad Moore reminds me of how important it is and how I'm really leaving one of the most important tools we have as visual storytellers. I'm just leaving it by the wayside and I need to kind of, I need to come back. I need to get in there. Um, I should really be using it. And I will tell you that my proportions were off in the sense that the door way should really like this little triangle that I'm doing here where I'm drawing this shadow between the door and the underside of the, uh, of the, the door frame that this shape that I'm drawing, all of this should be on the inside of the railing. Because in the reference, that's that's how it is. So I got the, the proportions off. Misguided. Didn't nail it. You know what I really love about this particular photo is that this guy, while his costume is creepy, he looks afraid. And there's something about the idea of someone who looks like they should be scary having fear on their face that to me is narratively powerful. I also don't like the fact that I completely botched it. I got so caught up in the um, trying to get the composition down that I really did not do a good job of getting his gesture. His body should be leaning into the frame more. And so that really enhan enhances the fact that he is looking to the left and up. And I really did not capture that. And that's one of the reasons why I want to come back and redraw. Like I had intended to do that uh, that Batman sketch super fast and then spend an hour drawing this. And I think what I will do is if you guys would pardon it, if you don't mind, I actually would like to come back and do a complete redraw of this piece I'm doing now. The next time I do a film still do a film study, frame study, me bad at words. Let's see what happens if I just try to hatch my way out of this.
and it's kind of a cheat because these lines automatically work as a compositional tool by pointing the viewer's eye towards the object, towards the focus, which is the, the man coming down the stairs. But I also feel like there should be more a little bit more light around the uh, the lower half, the stair, where the banister turns. And I know that I could just do this by changing the opacity and putting a simple, uh, painting a, a, a gradient into there. But I'm trying to learn how to do this with just, you know, three values. Like as Soretzi said, um, you know, he's got a, you know, he's working on doing realistic values and I'm looking, I'm looking to improve my use of value as both tonal composition as well as, uh, to render form and it can be challenging to do both at the same time but i think that's why i want to do it is because it's challenging but it's also a very useful tool i would say like i really feel like i did not get the things that make this costume interesting in there. Like I would love to just sit and just do a full painting of this, just do a full digital painting of this piece. Like this composition to me is so beautiful. It feels master study worthy. little bit of light coming from the other room wrapping around the uh, the banister I mean hell this makes me want to go watch this movie What's funny, you know, we were talking about value and I had started by painting his face white because, you know, it's Caucasian skin tones. But if you look at this, I mean, if you squint, yes, you can kind of just drop his whole face down into one value being the, you know, of the, the skin tone. But you can very clearly see that he's got a highlight hitting the left side of his face and then a shadow side on the right. So like just within his skin tone, you're getting a very clear sense of value in terms of he's being hit by the light from the doorway. Um, then you get the front plane getting kind of the local value and then that darker plane on the right side. And I'm wondering what would have, well, no, because when I squint, that facial plane that's forward still stands out from the gray of the rest of this um yeah there's a lot going on here value wise that is worth me revisiting and taking another slower pate stab at this so i may come back in next time and do a, a whole nother another shot um all right guys last couple of comments and then we're out of here so let's see here and Suretsi says, uh, I agree with you, James, on, uh, on Corbin's work. Um, 
I agree too. Um, Kings of Fitness says, I'll post what I painted on the Discord channel. Awesome. I look forward to seeing it. Which, by the way, guys, you know, if you uh, become a Patreon subscriber, that's one of the things we do on the Discord is we share artwork back and forth, have an ongoing conversation. We continue this type of conversation that we're doing here throughout the month. $2 a month gets you in the door. Um, Kings Love Fitness says film still um, sounds cool. Yeah, I mean, I, I this is one of those things that I picked up from um, just taking classes on storyboarding and composition. Like studying film stills is one of the things that people highly recommend because, I mean, you're looking at, you know, 24 frames per minute of composition and just studying the lighting, the the movement of people, figures and forms through frames, um, the definition of form, the obscuration of form, and how all of that works in with the story. So James says, I almost took him for um, Robert Zidar because of his mask. Um, give me the impression of enlarged jawline. Um, I do not know Robert Zidar. I will make a note of that and uh, and look him up. Find out who that is. Soretzi uh, says, I have tons of film stills as reference. Um, I started using that website Film Grab because I'm just like, I'll grab what I need as I need it, but I just, I, it would take forever and clutter up my drive if I was holding on to everything. Um, it's here. <laughs> James says, um, Yeah, I would not want to cross paths. Um, I would not want to cross paths with that guy. Yeah, you know, I mean, it's interesting. I can't quite tell whether he's supposed to be tall and menacing or kind of like i almost see him more as he has the ability to be creepy but he's not necessarily imposing creepy but not you know yeah don't know if i'd want to run across him in a, in a dark alley but Soretzi says uh tons of film stills as reference uh, let's see especially for shortening yeah for shortening is it's one of those things where you need to understand the structure and then you need to combine it with the photo reference in the sense that when you look at foreshortening in reality, your brain understands it because we're looking in three-dimensional life. And when you see it in flattened in a photo, your brain just accepts it. But when you put it on paper, there's something about that separation where it's like what worked fine in photos now becomes it be, it just doesn't look believable. You know, and maybe it's because of the way that light wraps around form and shadow wraps around form. And until you do a drawing and render it that way, it just looks like weird overlapping shapes that don't make sense. But you have to add those depth cues and those things to convince the the viewer's eye that these objects are one in front of another in front of another. So it's very challenging. Um, all right, guys. So like I said, if you're in the LA area, next week, WonderCon Anaheim, Artist Alley, uh, booth D23. So there won't be a live stream next week, but hey, hopefully you guys can come by, say hi in person. Um, and then after that, um, again, I don't think I'm gonna have time to even. I've got a bunch of stuff going on that may prevent me from getting making any progress on the on the the graphic novel. Maybe I'll do some character design just to break it up between the film stills and the figure drawing. So at least I'm making a little bit of progress on the comic book. I know that it's been so long since I've been showing any comic book work, but it is the obsession of having produced three graphic novels worth of material and saying, I want the writing on this next book to be better than anything I've done before. Um, not perfect, not perfection, just better. But trying to figure out just how good I can make it is what's forcing me to spend so much time doing a deep dive and really ruminating on this, which again, I don't know if I will have a chance to do any of that deep diving over the next week or two. Um, let's see here. Soretzi says, I have to get back to binging three, bo three body problem. Just want to stop by and say hi, goodbye to one and all. Uh, I'm glad to hear it's good. I've been hearing great things about it. Have not had a chance to start it yet. Uh, my wife and I, we've been watching uh, the haunting of Bly Manor. So that's been taking up time that would be, you know, 
I got, I'm gonna have to ease her into three body problem because it's from the looks of it, it's a little bit more high concept than she likes kind of meat and potatoes, horror, adventure, adventure, fantasy, drama, straightforward. And that show does look like it might be a little weirder. But the fact that it's produced by the guys from Game of Thrones and she likes loves Game of Thrones, that's a good selling point. So I might be able to talk her into it. Um, Let's see here. James has a good time. Says, have a good time at WonderCon. Thank you, James, so much. I'm really looking forward to it. Um, it's probably going to be my only convention of the year, so I want to make the most of it. And I, I love that show for years, so I'm looking forward to, to getting back out on the floor and in front of people. All right, gang. So on that note, if you enjoy these live streams, I'd like to get additional bonus live streams twice a month. You can become a Patreon subscriber for as little as $2 a month. We do deep dive live streams twice a month that are two and a half, three hours long, where we go into some of the best art books around to suck out all the knowledge we can. Right now, we've been doing a long running series on Walt Reed's The Figure. Um, so if you want to join in on those, we'll have the voice channel open on Discord while we're doing it. So it's not just typing in the chat. You can just get on and we can just talk back and forth like real human beings um, while we're drawing. You can also share stuff in the Dis Patreon exclusive Discord server. So if there's something you want me to look at, do drawovers. We can just talk and go more into depth and do each other's work. We can do all of that. And as I said, you also get access to a digital archive to read my comics online. So head on over to patreon.com slash Jeremy. It's patreon.com slash G-E-R-I-M-I. If you'd like to get my free monthly newsletter, head on over to newsletter.jeremy.net. There's links in the description for the video along with the Patreon link. Um, you'll get blog posts about what I'm reading, what I'm watching, what's inspiring me creatively. You will get work in progress animated GIFs um, showing you know, piece by piece development of piece work and more. So head on over there and check that out. And if you'd like to pick up physical copies of my comics, if you read digitally on Kindle, you go to Amazon.Jeremy.net. You can pick up books like my first graphic novel, Eye of the Gods. It is a standalone psychological thriller about a man cursed with visions he cannot control. Or you can pick up my most recent project, Morningstar. It is a retelling of Lucifer's Fall from Heaven told as a Western. So it's an eight-issue series. Volume 1 contains issues 1 through 4. Volume 2 contains the conclusion, issues 5 through 8. Both volumes have extensive back matter, uh, character designs, thumbnails, script excerpts, and more photo reference. I pretty much show you how I put the entire comic book together. And if you want to see what's inside before picking them up, head on over to my YouTube channel homepage, scroll down to book flip-throughs, and you will be able to flip through and see what's inside the book before picking it up. All right, gang. So... If you know anybody else who you think would enjoy these videos, enjoy the types of conversations we have here, please share it with them. Hit that share button. Hit that like button. Help spread the word. Thank you so much. That's it for now. Go be creative.